Well, we are tremendously privileged to have our friends, Pastor David and Beth Grant, with us this weekend. Uh, Beth spoke yesterday to our ladies at a women's luncheon. We had a beautiful time together. A few of us men snuck in, and uh, David is bringing us a word uh, this morning. David and Beth are the founders of Project Rescue, uh, a very special ministry that is rescuing young girls, women, children out of sex trafficking all around the world. Their work started in India uh, over 20 years ago and it has expanded to eight different countries. There are 500 volunteers working for Project Rescue uh, in the Ministry of Rescuing. Uh, young girls, young women uh, who have been trafficked, who have been sold into sex slavery. Um, we have been to India. We have seen uh, two of their locations where they have young boys and girls that have been taken out of the brothels. And uh, I want to tell you, their stories are absolutely heartbreaking. But when you see those beautiful children and you see the shine on their face and the joy on their face and you see that they're at peace and you see that they have hope for their future. They're receiving an education. They're receiving training and trades so that they can uh, have a living and have a life and have a future. It is just the most amazing thing and it just blesses your heart. David and Beth have been with us um, several times before. Beth is an executive presbyter for our denomination, the Assemblies of God. She's the first woman executive presbyter to serve our denomination. Uh, she is also the chairman of the spiritual advisory board for our denomination seminary. She's an adjunct professor uh, at our seminary and teaches at several different venues around the world. Uh, David and Beth have authored numerous books and they brought a few of them along. They're out on the book table. I don't know whether the greedy people in first service left anything out there on the table, but uh, they brought some books along and they're out on the table and uh, you can check those out at the end of the service today. But I know, you, I know you just got settled and you're comfy in your seat, but would you stand on your feet and would you give your best Harvest Time welcome for our friends, David and Beth Grant. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you and good morning. God bless every one of you. Thank you. What a good thank you. And a happy Mother's Day to all of you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. What a joy. What a joy. Hallelujah. Well, I was born near my mother. That's a strange statement, isn't it? And I miss her this morning. She went to heaven three years ago at the age of 90. And uh, the day she went into heaven, she told her doctor, she says, I'm going to heaven today. Don't slow me down. <laughs> and it was a wonderful passing and a wonderful time. And I said to my wife driving to church this morning, uh, I miss calling her because I always... Stayed on the phone. I was good on the phone. And uh, it is a joy for Beth and I to be with you on Mother's Day. And to be with uh, Glenn and Denise and their three wonderful children and so many of you who are friends. And those who are with us at the ladies' luncheon yesterday. What a joy. Fantastic time. Fantastic time. 200 mostly women, but a few of us men. And uh, it is a great weekend. Last night was a wonderful Saturday night service. 8.30 service I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, Beth said to me a moment ago, this service is a little more lively, isn't it? <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. And uh, thank you for being here this Mother's Day. And my prayer is that God will touch your heart with his word today and encourage your family in Jesus. We're going to show a video on human trafficking for a moment. And... Uh, in it, you will see a couple of our leaders, Fiona from Madrid, Spain. We started out 20 years ago in India when we walked into the red light district in Bombay and found 100,000 girls. In Delhi, there's only 75,000. In Calcutta, there's only 60,000. When I say only, how heartbreaking to say only. There's over a million of these girls in India that we're trying to reach for Jesus Christ. 
rescue and redeem and restore. And in the back of the book table, there's a story there on Beyond the Soil Curtain, the story of the girls rescued out of the Bombay brothels and the new life God has given them. And uh, the second book is called Beyond the Shame, Project Rescue's Fight to Restore Dignity to Survivors of Sexual Slavery. And then my wife's most recent book, Courageous Compassion. And that's what we pray that today, at this Mother's Day, there will be a baptism of courageous compassion that will flow through our church. It is a joy for Beth and I to come. We just uh, FaceTimed our daughter in India. Rebecca and Tyler and their two children are in North India. And uh, it was a great joy to wish them a Mother's Day and for them to wish us. Our younger daughter, Jennifer, and her husband, John, and their two children, our four grandkids, they are in Boston today with his grandmother. And uh, it's just wonderful. And it's wonderful being a grandfather, married to a grandmother. I tell you, it's wonderful. Just wonderful. I know you look at Beth and I and you go, you're such young people. I, I understand. But we've been married 40 years. 40 years. In fact, I carry around with me a uh, photo of our wedding. I just love it. I weighed 125 pounds. That's it. I love it. And I'll tell you more about it today with the video we're about to show you in just a moment is a heartbreaking story. No, it's not a story, but just an example of 20 years ago, the first night in the red light district in Bombay, they gave us 37 little girls out of the brothels. This past year, we were able to touch the lives of 37,000 girls in eight countries. And it was usually via Fiona from Madrid, Spain. Spain has legalized prostitution and it has become the brothel of Europe. They estimate that a million men a day in Spain purchase prostitution services. When you've got that kind of demand, they're trafficking girls from Eastern Europe, but primarily now from West Africa into Spain and France. The French police came to our Project Rescue team in France a few weeks ago and said, we have many, many West African girls who are walking the streets. They say they're Christians, but they say they're under a voodoo curse and they cannot leave the streets. And we policemen are trying to help them, but we're not spiritual people, but you are. Can you come help us minister to these girls? And I said, our team said, that's exactly what we do. And God opens doors, not only in Asia, but in Europe and in the Middle East. The million migrants that have gone into Europe in the last few months. Thousands and thousands of women and children are now missing from those migrants who have disappeared. So your prayers on this Mother's Day is that God would help us to help the mothers and the daughters. Primarily the girls are more vulnerable than anyone else. That God will help us. So the video you're about to see for a moment has Fiona from Madrid, uh, Reagan, who's been working in Romania for 18 years. When she first went to Romania, there were 300,000 street children. 300,000 street children in Romania. And then you'll see Devaraj from Bombay. Devaraj is like an apostle. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children rescued. We'll tell you more about it in a moment. Let's go ahead and show the video. Sexual exploitation has been with us for thousands of years. Globalization has only escalated this horrendous evil. We are now at a point in the world where every single nation is involved in some way with sex trafficking of women and children. The Spanish police say that 90% of the people who are arriving on boats as refugees from Africa are actually victims of human trafficking. 500,000 is estimated um, number of women that come in annually 
um, are trafficked into Europe and forced into prostitution. Every tourist spot in the world has a dark side people don't see. So our world is the dark places where most people have given up. Our goal is through Jesus to reach out to the whole system where you transform people's lives and give them hope and bring about a revolution of justice. So people say to us, does Project Rescue do raids? We say, no, we do relationships. A raid, you only do one time. But a relationship is that you go into the brothels, you establish Bible studies, you go in and establish prayer and show them there's a way out. If we just take a woman physically out of the brothel to a safe place, that's only the beginning of rescue. Until she is free body, mind, and spirit to make new choices, to become the woman of God she was created to be, the job's only half done. Life-changing aftercare is the most intense part of the healing process. It requires medical, physical, and emotional support, as well as education and vocational training. But these are not enough. Prostituted women and children need spiritual freedom and a new identity that can only come through Jesus Christ. You don't go to the core issue, and if Christ doesn't come in and heal that woman's soul, then she's going to go back. When we first interview a woman that's in that situation, she doesn't have any self-worth. She can't even lift up her head and look at you in the eyes. I felt a sense of urgency that I need to move there like my, my daughters. I'm not going to wait for anybody else to decide or have a meeting. In the scripture, it says, if any woman, man, child, be in Christ, they're in new creation. So that promise, it seems just about, OK, we're going to get you into a better place. Over time, as she experiences God's truth about herself, you're not a prostitute. No, you're a daughter of God. Project Rescue. Hope starts here. Amen. Our scripture for the day is found in John chapter 14 and verse 1. We'll put it on the screen. If you'd like to open your Bibles and make a note of it, it's John 14, 1 through 3. If you're reading the Bible, wonderful. If not, you can look up with me. And we're reading out of, I think, the King James Version, because it has an interesting word in it. If you read it with me reverently for a moment, let's start. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, why I know this is in King James, because it uses the word mansions. In the NIV, it says, there are many rooms in my father's house. In another version, it says, there's lots of room in my father's house. And that really speaks to me more than anything in the world. My father wants every person on this planet to dwell in his house. My father has made room. There is a place for you in father's house. There's a place for you at father's table. There's a place for you in father's heart. There is a father today that has surrounds you through his love and his power. That father makes all the difference in the world. I 
In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. A place. I'm captured by that one word, place. What is my place? Where is my place? Do I have a place? And I, out of this one scripture, I find incredible joy. I go to prepare a place for you. And somehow that scripture expands in my own heart to missions. What does a missionary do? I go to prepare a place for someone who doesn't have a place. I go to tell someone they have a room in Father's house that they may not know about. There's a room reserved just for you. A room. I say it again, a place at the table. My dad and mom, I'm one of five children. My dad pastored in 10 cities the first 11 years of my life. We knew more about U-Haul than we did anything else. It's kind of like a one-year revival. And then when I was 11, dad moved to Pensacola, Florida, and pioneered a new church and stayed 17 years, so I graduated from high school. Many of those parsonages were two-bedroom. And before, when there was just three of us boys, dad and mom stayed in one room and the three of us boys in the other. And my dad's favorite sermon was the rapture. Jesus is coming Tonight, and nobody's going. Straight is the way, narrow is the gate, and nobody finds it. Two should be in the bed, neither will go. Two will be at the well, neither will make it. Heaven's going to be a desert because nobody's going to be there. Only the few righteous and pure, and none of y'all qualify. The only hope they gave us was if you would come to the altar right now, you might have a chance. So we fill the altars every service. I got saved 150 times. People say to me, do you remember when you got saved? I said, yeah, 150 times. We, live, we grew up getting saved. I was 12 years old when I finally found a scripture that said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, Jesus, I've called 150 times. And you answered, and I'm saved. And I'm nailing my fears of the rapture. And my fears of everything, I'm nailing it to the cross. As I started to mention in this boy's bedroom, Dad said, Jesus will come at midnight. And we had this clock in the living room would strike the hour. And I would never go to sleep till after midnight. Because I knew Jesus was coming. I had to be awake. When it would strike 12, I would listen intently for my parents. Because my brothers were there, but that didn't help me because I knew they weren't going. And I, I would go in my parents' room and feel on the bed. And Daddy would say, what's wrong? Nothing, everything's okay. Just, just, just check it. Just check it. I'd come in from school and I'd walk in the parsonage and I'd call, Mama! If she didn't answer, my heart stopped. They're gone! And I'm left. <laughs> oh, my. Did any of y'all grow up that way? Oh, my goodness. Have mercy. And then to find safety and find my place without fear. Hallelujah. It was wonderful. Wonderful. Dad preached against television. He said, television is like a commode sitting in your living room, <laughs> flushing sewage into the minds of your children. So we had to go to the deacon's house to watch TV. <laughs> when the kids in the neighborhood got together to play games, the only game we knew how to play was church. <laughs> we didn't know how to play cops and robbers and cowboys and Indians and prostitutes and drug addicts. We never saw any of it. All we saw was Church. And I was the preacher for the neighborhood from the age of six. And our cat died. We put him in a shoebox and I preached him into heaven. It was a wonderful funeral. It was so good we dug him up the next day and did it all over again. The third day we dug him up, Mama Kata, she said, 
bury that cat and leave her in peace. We cried because we heard a cat had nine lives. <laughs> Dad had a, lots of gardens and animals and all and a dozen chickens. And Sunday night was a water baptismal service. Monday morning, my brother said to me, the chickens aren't going to heaven. They have been baptized. I said, I will baptize the chickens. <laughs> we couldn't find the water, but Dad had a big container of gasoline beside the house. Dad came home and he shouted, who killed the chickens? We said, we didn't kill them. We baptized them. <laughs> and God took them to heaven. That was my childhood. Getting saved, preaching cats' funerals, baptizing chickens. And the second thing happened to me when I was 12 years old was a missionary named Charles Greenaway came to my dad's church and he told the story of a 12 year old boy who had no money to put in the missionary offering at the end of the service. At the end of the service, we would receive a missionary offering. And this 12 year old boy took the offering pan and he took it and he said, Jesus, I don't have any money. All I've got is me, but you can have me. And he laid that offering pan on the floor and he stood up in it. And that missionary said, that was the greatest missionary offering we ever received. A 12 year old boy standing in an offering pan. When he told that, I was so touched. And that night at the end of the service when the missionary offering was taken and, and the pan came to me, I said, if that other boy can do it, so can I. And I laid the pan on the floor and I stood up in it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my 12-year-old heart and said, David, I want you to go to India. You will spend your life in India. And for the last 47 years, I have fulfilled that promise that I made standing in the offering pan when I was 12 years old. And at 12, I began to give to missions. My first faith promise was $10 a week, $520 a year. By the time I was 16, my faith promise was $25 a week, $100 a month, $1,200 a year. I graduated from high school at 17. I was already preaching all over Florida. I became a full-time evangelist at 17. And I made a vow to God I would not marry till I was 30. I said, Lord, I want to give you 13 years. You get every day and every dollar of my life. I will not marry. I will not invest in anything. Every dollar will go to missions. I average giving to missions $400 a week, $20,000 a year. By the time I turned 31, I'd give over $250,000 to missions out of my personal. Didn't have a wife, so I didn't have any bills. Didn't have any kids. Didn't have an apartment. Didn't have nothing. I went to India when I was 22. And then at 31, God brought Beth into my life, which I will be forever grateful. I was preaching a youth camp in Pennsylvania, and Beth and her first husband, Brian Schaefer, were leading the worship. We became great friends, Brian, myself, and Beth. I was, at that time, 29. They were 25. I left that youth camp, went back overseas for a year. Six weeks after I left, Brian was killed in an accident. And Beth became a widow at 25 years of age. She stayed on at the church outside of Philadelphia as the minister of music, minister of youth, church of 500 people. And the principal of the Christian day school. She was the minister of music, minister of youth, Principal Christian Day School. And when she left that church two years later, they hired three men to take her place. <laughs> Hallelujah. We men are valuable. We're worth one third of a woman. <laughs> and I was preaching in Washington, D.C., and one of those men came up to me and said I was one of the three. <laughs> it was something. A year later, I came back from India, and I found out about Brian, and I phoned Beth. And I said, I'm so sorry. How are, how are you doing? I'll never forget her answer. She said, David, there's sadness, but there's peace. We are like currency in the hands of God. He can spend us as he pleases. We're not our own. He can invest us wherever he wants. I was so captured by that sense of abandonment. I'd call occasionally. In fact, that 
year I called 200 times. I was turning 31. I was praying one night. I said, God, I've given you everything for missions and for India since I was 17. 13 years. And I'm willing to continue. But if you ever wanted me to get married, how about Beth Schaefer? And the moment I called her name in prayer, which was the first time in two years, God spoke to me and said, she's the one. I grabbed the phone and called my dad in Pensacola, Florida. I said, I'm getting married. <laughs> he said, to whom? I didn't even know you were going with anybody. I said, I've never gone with her. What is she like? Wonderful. What does she look like? Beautiful. But I haven't seen her in two years. The last time I saw her, she was married to somebody else. He said, I'll be praying for you. I hung up with Dad, and I phoned Beth. I said, could I take you to lunch tomorrow? She said, sure. She was in Philadelphia. I was in Dallas. And I had to be in Los Angeles that night to fly to India for six months. But I got to settle that today. So I flew to Philadelphia and took her to lunch and proposed. I said, I know this is going to sound strange. You would have prayed through about it. It's God's will. I love you, and I'm going to marry you. <laughs> she said, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> I said, I'm not officially proposing. I'm leaving for India tonight. I'll be gone for six months, and I just wanted to tell you how I felt. And you don't have to answer. And I'd like to write to you, and I do not want you to write me back. I need to write and build a foundation of trust beneath you that you can trust again after Brian's death two years ago. For God is a God who honors our past and our present, but he's also God of our future. So I flew off to India that night, and I wrote 180 letters in 180 days and flew back to Philadelphia and said, what do you think? She said, I believe the Lord's in this, and I will marry you. I said, amen. I will not put you under pressure. Take all the time you need. But 10 weeks from now, you and I are scared. You'll be back in India. <laughs> And I said, and if you don't go, I'm not going to go in and thousands of people will die and go to hell. But there's no, there's no pressure on it. Nine weeks later, we were married. And a week later, we were in India. Now, this is 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Things were a little different in India in those days. A lot have changed since then. First night, I stood in front of 10,000 people in a big meeting, and I said... I want you to meet my wife, who is a widow. 10,000 people looked at each other and said, he married a widow. He married a widow. He married a widow. For 10 minutes, the crowd was talking before we could proceed with the service. After the service, the leader came and he said, now, David, you've been in India for almost nine years as a single man. But he said, you don't fully understand that in our culture, an orphan is cursed because he has no father. Because your father is your total identity. And a widow is cursed because her husband has died. She no longer has identity. No one would marry a widow. And a widow would marry no one. Her life is over. And I said, well, I'm speaking to the pastors tomorrow. Oh, it's okay. Share with them anything. I stood the next morning. This is 40 years ago, remember. And I opened my scripture, or Bible, and I began to read. He is the father of the fatherless. And in his economy, there is no orphans. For he has stepped down and said, I I'm the Father. In my Father's house, there is room for all the orphans because they belong to Him. He is the Father. Say it with me. The Father of the fatherless. There is no curse on the orphans. Amen. And then I begin to read where He says, And I am the widow's protector. Provider, covering, identity. I am her identity. The Holy Spirit fell on those 500 pastors. 
they began to weep. They said, we have followed our culture more than we followed this book. But they said, from this moment, we will embrace the orphan, for God's their father. And from this moment, we will honor the widow. She will be the most honored person in our church, for God is her covering. God is her identity. God is her protector. God is her provider. Something happened that day, 40 years ago, that changed the direction of much of where my wife were involved. So instead of me saying, I'll never mention it again, I mention it every service. He's the God of new beginnings. He's the God who can take your past and bring healing. He's the God who says you are not identified by death. Our mistakes are your past. I have washed that away. And I have placed your sins in the sea of forgetfulness that no one can bring them up again. Hallelujah. He's a God of new beginnings. The God of new beginnings. Hallelujah. He doesn't get up every morning and remember all my failures. I remember them, but he doesn't. He has chosen to place them beneath his blood. And they are forgiven. No, we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. And he's our father. Would you read it with me again? I go to prepare a place for you. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of new beginning. It's a place of incredible opportunities. I go to prepare a place. Where are you today on Mother's Day? Are you stuck in a place of unforgiveness? Are you stuck in a place of bitterness? Are you stuck in a place of shame and paralysis? I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but the thousands of girls we have helped to rescue. The book says, Beyond the Shame, Project Rescue's Fight to Restore Dignity to Survivors. His purpose is to shatter the shame in our lives and give us a new beginning. A new beginning. What can we do to give a little girl rescued out of a brothel a new beginning? $20 a month We'll put one of our girls to school. $20 a month. $100 a month, we'll take a little girl and provide her a place of safety and shelter, a bed, a room, an education, food, medical care. Everything she needs will be provided for $100 a month. We have 150 of our girls in college right now. College is $1,200 a year. $1,200 a year to put our girls to college. We've got girls who came out of the brothels who are now ministers, counselors, leaders, staff, married to pastors, It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. A new beginning. A church in Denver called Red Rocks. They have 6,000 people in a dozen different locations. And their pastor said, we meet in rented locations. We have no property. The only property we have is two brothels in New Delhi, India that we purchased and turned them into house churches red light district churches not near the sound of church and chapel bells but at the doorway to hell our goal is to transform dark communities as you saw in the video our world is the world of dark places our world is not the world of a village church or a city cathedral our world 
is where the broken and the hurting and the violated and the abused, that's our world. That's our world. Project Rescue, this church has been one of our largest supporting churches in Project Rescue's history because you have joined with us in saying these girls need a new beginning. Whether they're African girls in Spain, whether they're in France, whether they're in Belgium, Moldova, Ukraine, Russia, or if they're in India or Nepal or Bangladesh or Thailand or the Philippines, wherever they are, they have a father. And that father is not willing that they perish. And that father has commissioned you and I to make a difference. That father has said, help find a place. I go to prepare a place for you in heaven, yes. But he's going to prepare a place for you right now, right here. Your place is in the family of God. Your place is in the body of Christ. In this church, your place is in the kingdom. The Father has made a place for you. On Mother's Day, I must share one story before I close. My dad would pray over us every time we left the house. When I left for India at 22 years of age from our airport in Pensacola, Florida, dad said, Let, whole family was out at the airport. He said, let's pray. There was 400 people sending their friends off on that flight. I thought we'd have a family huddle, not dad. He threw his head back and cried out, God, David's going to India. 400 people knew I was going to India. He covered me with the blood of Jesus, covered the plane, covered the pilot, covered everybody that rode the plane. Ten minutes of prayer. When he finished, I got on the plane, and the businessman sat out beside me and said, Was that your dad? I looked at him, and tears running down his face. He said, I have heard a prayer like that in 25 years. He said, 25 years ago, my dad used to pray over me every day just like that. But dad died 25 years ago. I walked out of his funeral angry at God, and I swore I'd never go to church again, and I haven't. But when your dad lifted his voice and began to plead the blood, he said it all came back. He said, I felt an arm go around my shoulder I haven't felt in 25 years. And it wasn't even your dad's voice that rang in my ears. It was my dad's voice. And while your dad prayed and pled the blood, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. He said, I'm back under the blood. 25 years later, I'm back under the blood. And I began to weep. And I thought of the psalmist David. He said, God bottles up our tears as incense that of sins before the throne of God. You are here because somebody prayed. You're here because somebody believed. You're here because somebody stood between you and death and you and darkness. You're here because some mother, some father made a difference in your life. They may not even be alive today, but their prayers are still in fact in your life. Would you lift your hands with mine right now and plead the blood over your family, your children, your grandchildren, your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, your parents. Just lift your hands and say, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood that stands between life and death. I plead the blood. Salvation for my family. Salvation for my children. Salvation for my grandchildren. Salvation for my marriage. Salvation for my brother. Salvation for my sister. And salvation for my parents. Spirit of the living God, lift your hands and pray in the Spirit for a moment. And say, Spirit, Spirit of the living God, pray through me. Pray through me. Intercede through me with the language of heaven. And the Spirit will intercede according to the will of God hallelujah 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 now I want you to take your hand put it right over your heart and say with me Lord Jesus there's a place in my heart 
just for you. Please come. Fill that place. Let there be no emptiness, no vacuum, no darkness. Come light of the world. Come Savior of the world. Come Lamb of God. Slain from the foundation of the earth. Risen from the dead. Ascended to the Father. Come Lord Jesus. Save me. Heal me. Forgive me. Wash me. In the precious blood of Jesus. Lift both of your hands and say, Lord, I praise you for hearing my prayer. I praise you for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. One little seven-year-old girl was given to us out of a brothel. Her mother died, and her mother said, please give her to Project Rescue she, because she was dying. Never knew a father. She was seven when she was brought in and I held her in my arms her arms and legs were big as my finger skin and bones diseased malnourished our doctor said She'll, she won't live she can't she's dying I spent as much time with that little girl as I could she became my adopted niece Came time for me to leave. I took her in my arms. I said, honey, Uncle David's got to go. But I'll be back and I'll see you in a few weeks. She said, no, Uncle David, I'll never see you again. I won't be here when you come back. She knew she was dying. I knew she was dying. I couldn't speak. Tears were going to run down my face. And she reached up a tiny hand because I was holding her in my arms. And she brushed the tears off my cheek and said, don't worry about me, Uncle David. I've got Jesus. I've got Jesus. I've got Jesus, and he's all I need. Never knew a father. Her mother's now dead. No one claimed this little daughter of shame, but she said, I've got Jesus. I put her on the floor and walked away, got on the plane. I was crying when the flood of the city. I said, God, there's a million little girls we're praying for tonight, but there's one. She doesn't have a dad. She didn't have a mom. She has no future. She's dying. And every church I went to, I called her name and asked people to pray. I confess, I struggled with my faith for her. I flew back to India, stepped out of the airport, and that little girl came screaming down the sidewalk. Uncle David, she called out. I swept her up in my arms and said the stupidest thing I've ever said. I said, honey, what are you doing here? She said, Jesus has healed me, and I've been adopted by a Christian family. I have a new mother and Uncle David. I have a daddy for the first time in my life. The father. There's room. There's room. There's room. There's room. There's room. And you and I are going to make a place. We have a home just for little children with AIDS in Bombay. I go to that, play, that home, my favorite. The little girl takes me with a hand and says, Uncle, let me show you my place. And she takes me to her cot and says, this is where I sleep. She used to sleep in her mother's bed in the brothel. But this is where I sleep. Nobody sleeps here but me. This is my place. She'll open the cupboard and say, this is my stuff. Jesus, through somebody, gave her a place. My wife has edited a curriculum for caregivers of human of trafficking victims. It's called Hands and Heal. Pastor, come pray over us, but I want you to lift your hands and say, God, let my hands be healing hands. Let my hands be healing hands on Mother's Day. On Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, let my hands be healing hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's just uh, give thanks to the Lord for sending Pastor David to share that word with us today.